Encounter is brought to you by the Brim County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Good morning, I'm Jeff Kellum. Welcome to this week's edition of Encounter. I'll be your host today. I'm the parish associate at the Union Presbyterian Church in Endicott. Today's program is a departure from our normal format. A few months ago, I was commissioned as a volunteer to create a video for the staff of a local hospital, a short film about staying strong in spirit, offering some guidance about how to get through some trying times for healthcare professionals. Now, while the content was designed for folks in healthcare, uh, I think that the program will be helpful for anyone whose work has become more stressful, uh, anyone whose daily responsibilities uh, are so challenging that it drains one's very breath and challenges one's spirit by day's end. So I'm the narrator, and I have two guests today. One of them is Dr. James Kellum, who is a biology professor at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. The other is Wendy Kellum Franzies, executive staff assistant, student, and campus life at Cornell University. You can tell by their names, they're my kids. How they fit into this general theme of spirituality in the workplace will become evident as you hear their voices later in the program. Now, a note to our radio listeners, um, unless you have your special Council of Churches magic glasses, uh, you'll be relying on the soundtrack. No worries about that. There's plenty to hear, including some music that comes under the video now and then. So I invite you to take a deep breath and consider how to stay strong in spirit. Spirituality in the workplace, the challenges of keeping strong in spirit. It goes without saying, but everybody's saying it anyway, that these are troubling times. For troubling, you could substitute strange or stressful or however you're feeling today. Working in an institutional environment, um, well, the troubles, the stressors can be multiplied. You add the profound layer of health care to the universe of one's vocation, and there you are trying to be the best human being you can be under sometimes very trying circumstances. The best human being. I used to work with teenagers back when I was a lot closer in age to them than I am now, and I emphasized the dimensions of a full humanity, body, mind, and spirit, the three dimensions of wholeness. Now, these kids, of course, being adolescents, were very aware of their bodies. And they knew that their minds were being shaped through curiosity and through education, reading, uh, electronic media. But the youth culture, even for youth involved in religious institutions, was weak, if not downright bereft when it came to the nurture of their spirit. Those kids knew school spirit and team spirit, maybe community spirit, but that, that inner, what, heart, flame, power, well, that was rarely acknowledged, much less addressed. And yet they knew its lack through feelings like loneliness, and anxiety, a kind of emptiness that they couldn't quite name. So we explored the encounter of the third kind, the nurture of the human spirit. In the context of their faith, it was understood as a gift from the Spirit of God. I'm wondering, as you go to work day by day, 
whether within the physical confines of an office or, or perhaps working at home, do you sometimes or often feel overwhelmed, uh, frustrated, out of breath? In the age of COVID, and there I've gone and named the enemy, those of you who work in healthcare can find the unity of body, mind, and spirit compromised or exhausted or otherwise kicked around until you do feel breathless. A reminder here, or maybe this is a revelation if it's the first time you've heard it, that the English word for spirit means in Latin and Greek, breath. The Latin spiritus means breath, and the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Think pneumonia or pneumatic. Breath, wind. In Hebrew, the word that comes close to the meaning of spirit is a wonderful example of onomatopoeia. Remember that word from, what, middle school maybe? Where the sound of the word imitates what it denotes. Ruach, breath, wind. You can't say the word ruach without expelling a great deal of breath. So if you're running out of breath at the end of the day, or the shift, or the week, you could be low on spirit. And that's not good for your work, your family, or your very self. So having been there, there was a time when I had three half-time jobs, add them up, and they all dealt with helping others stay spiritually strong, even while I seemed to grow emptier. So again, having been there, I've given some thought to how to cope, more than cope, maybe overcome, or at least get through these challenging times. A starting point was talking to my kids, and not the ones from my church so long ago, but the ones in my own family, Wendy and Jim. Wendy works at Cornell as executive staff assistant, student, and campus life. And currently part of her work is keeping students safe from the pandemic. And Jim is Dr. James Kellum. He's associate professor of biology at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and a two-time Ironman. Now both of them can run out of breath in their work as well as in balancing vocation, family, opportunities for recreation. Let's start with Jim, and not with his teaching load, but with his Iron Man thing. First, let's consider the metaphors of how sports fit with this whole conversation. You know, take the swimming part, keeping your head above water, not drowning in paperwork, maybe even swimming against the tide. And then the biking and running part of being an Ironman, it's running the good race, or to use the biblical metaphor, fighting the good fight. Running out of breath, perhaps, and catching your second wind, staying the course. I'm pedaling as fast as I can. It occurred to me that the Ironman competition involves several layers that even non-athletes like me can appreciate and learn from. Now for the uninitiated, the competition includes a swim of 2.4 miles, a 112 mile bicycle ride, and a marathon of 26.22 miles. All of it raced in that order and in one day, and an evening for many of those athletes. It's widely considered one of the most difficult one day sporting events in the world. And of course it involves planning, training, nutrition, pacing, balance, guides along the way, support of family and friends and even strangers. It also has will and determination. Now maybe that's redundant, but that's not always a bad thing. And for my son, it also involves prayer, as he'll discuss later. All that sounds like a good thing for any work week, doesn't it? Let me check out the parallels. In that early morning swim of almost two and a half miles, someone has carefully laid out the course. No one just jumps in and starts swimming. The swim course is laid out in advance uh, and it's marked with buoys. They're, they appear to be really big buoys, but when you're in the water uh, you, and, and they're quite distant, you, it's hard to see them. So, uh, so the buoys are there. Um, and then there are uh, kayakers usually uh, that are on the outside of the course trying to uh, get you to, to go straight and not miss a buoy. 
And somebody's laid out a course for you and your work, right? And obviously, before the athletes even sign up for this thing, they've trained, they've prepared, so they have some idea of what they're in for. And as the athletes head along that course in the water, there are guides along the way. There are volunteers in boats and kayaks who help with direction and safety protocols. You're not alone in your work either, are you? So while you're swimming, uh, you can go off on your own to avoid the crowd. And sometimes I'm in that mental space where I don't want to be near a whole bunch of people. It is actually sort of stressful uh, because you've got people everywhere and sometimes they bump into you. Um, but if you can get into a small group um, and draft behind the swimmer in front of you, uh, then it actually is easier to swim. They're breaking through the water and uh, so you, you end up going faster as a group than individually. And they choose a pace with which they are most comfortable. Their own sense of determination is energized by the presence back on the shore of family and friends and even strangers who cheer them on. And then there's this whole idea of swimming together with other people. And this might be where it gets hard for you. A feeling that there's not quite enough in your cheering section. Well then the swimmers emerge from the water, run into their changing areas and quickly get into their cycling gear. And I have to make a comment here about equipment, the bicycle. That bike better be ready for a 112 mile ride. The right seat, <laughs> that's comfortable. The, the right dimensions, uh, the right bike, the right tires, the right tire pressure, you get the idea. And you no doubt work with some equipment in your vocation too. A lot depends on its being just right. And if it isn't right, that adds to the stress, doesn't it? And often that rightness is not something you can fix. Well, once the riders are off on their course, there are some familiar patterns. The route is thoughtfully laid out, the pace of the race, supportive fans with their signs and their cheers, safety protocols in place, and always people there to help. Um, and then every, say, 10 or 15 miles, there's a, uh, a, a spot for refreshments. Um, and uh, there has been one race where um, there would be a support person a few hundred yards in advance of where the actual food was, and, and the, the person would say, what do you want? And I'd say, banana. And then they'd, you know, talk through their microphone or something and so the next person down would have a banana for me. The riders know when they have to speed up, when they have to slow the pace a little bit, maybe even stop to rest if they have to. How are you at that, pacing yourself? The experienced athlete also knows the value of nutrition. It's often called the fourth leg of the triathlon. Uh, in addition to swimming, biking and running, there's also nutrition. Uh, and that is harder to practice uh, because I might be able to do 100 miles on my bicycle, but I'm not, you know, during my training, I'm never going to do 100 miles of bike, bike riding and then 26 miles of running. Uh, that is not a training day, that is a race day. So during the bike ride, I have to make sure that I'm consuming enough calories to support my bike riding and to prepare my body for the marathon at the end of the race. 112 miles. And when that leg of the competition is over, you just go on then and run a full marathon. Again, the course is set, there are helpers along the way, and now at just the right time, the fan support is face to face. That is, finally the runners can see their families and their friends and feel their love. And there may be hundreds and even thousands of strangers shouting their encouragement for people they don't even know, including you. Again, pacing, rhythm, nutrition, hydration come into play. Our son, Jim, knew that when it got toward the end there, he had to walk for a while. He even gave himself permission to simply stop for a brief time, to breathe, to let his body relax a bit. And then he was off again. I don't know how many of these Ironman athletes expect to really win their brackets. Most are simply striving to achieve, to finish,
to be rewarded with the designation, you are an Iron Man. Finally, the race is over and every athlete is physically spent, out of breath, drained. But I guess that most are stronger spiritually than ever before. The spirit of competition, the human spirit, that inner stamina and strength. And as I mentioned before, knowing my son, I wasn't surprised to learn that prayer is a part of his journey. Like many athletes at the start of my race, uh, I say a prayer and it's um, not the same prayer. Uh, I, I don't have a, a memorized prayer or anything. Uh, I just close my eyes and concentrate and I pray um, that I uh, be safe um, and that God be with me and that, that I do the best that I can. You know, I get the strength from God to do the best that I can. I don't pray to win. I don't pray to make my goal time or anything like that. Um, it's just that you do this really, really long competition and it only comes once in a lifetime sometimes and, and you, you've prepared so long. It is, it's just a, a big event and you want it to go well. It's a very selfish prayer um, because it's, it's all self-centered. I just want to do well and I want to feel good. Um, but we all pray that, about other things like that. Uh, we, we always um, have prayers that, that say, Dear God, please help me accomplish this or help me uh, speak well when I'm presenting. Um, and so God's used to it. Uh, so that's the prayer in the beginning. Um, and then, sure, there are prayers at the end, uh, as I'm trying to finish, uh, particularly if it's not going well. Um, and, you know, I, my, my prayers don't magically, you know, make me feel better, uh, but it's nice to have a companion uh, following you along and, and um, listening to your, your pain and your, your strife and, uh, just giving it to someone else, in this case God, uh, makes the pain less. As I mentioned before, though, I do bike and I walk each day or try to and then and go to the local gym for exercise when it's safe. <laughs> I'm no Iron Man. I'm not even an aluminum man. But I do think that there are some parallels with the work of one's vocation during a time of pandemic. Let's look at your day by day, week by week work. Unless you're starting something totally innovated from scratch, someone has laid out a course for you with some guides to follow. So you aren't wandering alone in the wilderness. And there are people along the way to kind of shepherd you, to assist you, to care for you, especially early on. Look for them and look to them. Go ahead and lean on them. Can you pace yourself? Can you, like the runner, slow down now and then to catch your breath or to take care of yourself and then move a little bit more quickly maybe to, to find some momentum? And what fuels your vocation, your daily load? Are there decisions to make about your physical diet, your nutrition? What about rewarding yourself now and then? What fuels your spirit? Prayer, silence, meditation, music, taking a walk, just sitting in the quiet of the chapel. We won't ever ride a bicycle over a hundred miles in a day, but man, doesn't it seem like sometimes the race or the day or the task will never end. As fast as we pedal, as much energy as we exert. Well, let's switch gears. Well, let's move beyond the metaphor of sport. And maybe you're saying, well, it's about time. So I look to my daughter, Wendy, who, as I mentioned, her work at Cornell is, among other things, helping to keep that school more safe from the pandemic. I am an executive staff assistant in the office of the Vice President for Student and Campus Life at Cornell University. And our office, Student and Campus Life, embodies everything about the student experience except academics. We do tie into the academics, but it's not, um, that is not our focus. Our focus is the living learning experience for each student at the university. I asked Wendy if there was ever any stress in her work. 
<laughs> yes. Um, our, our, there is never a day that is the same. So one day um, we could be learning about diversity and inclusion for our staff so that we can uh, best support ourselves and therefore be good support systems for our students and serve uh, their needs. And um, uh, we have, uh, there's tragedy that we have to work through and, and help the students with crisis management. Uh, the health center is part of our organization and uh, it's a fully servicing or fully functioning health center uh, with diagnostic and, um, and, and education. Um, mental health is a huge, huge issue in uh, young adults. And we are, we're looking at the iGen, um, iGen generation, and um, it, they're not as prepared to be adults as uh, even Generation X or Generation Y. No, but personally, what about the stress on you? I, I'm, I have my own stress that I bring with me to the office every day because I'm a human being and um, we have to make sure that we're working together as a team and collaborating and making sure everyone has a say and, um, and, and that we're all aligned in decisions that we make. And um, if something has, is going on with, with one of my kids, then that's in my space and it's hard to turn that um, it's hard to turn that off when we're trying to help um, help serve the students that we need to. In order to deal with stress, I I take a walk at lunch, or I um, I I get up and I go visit a colleague on another floor so I can get a little bit of space away from the office. Isn't balance something to strive for when we face stress? I have to find a balance, and and I've had some trouble with that, but I've sought help to find um, tools that I can use to be to find to give myself balance. Um, some of the tools that I use to find balance in my my work life and my family life um, actually I've heard that there is no true balance so it's it's just a matter of working through the all the needs together. Um, I, I give myself space at home if I've had a really tough day I say to my family I need an hour or um, or I, I may not say that I need an hour, but I take it. Um, I do yoga. I have tried meditating. I'm not so great at that, but I'm really good at the end of yoga with the meditation that comes after that. Um, I try to exercise. I fail, and then I try again. And um, so I, I have learned to give myself grace. Wendy spoke of the very important idea of giving herself grace. That's a key element of the spiritual and psychological self-care, grace. And our lives become more full as we give that gift to others. I'm not a big fan of making nouns into verbs, but I like the idea of grace as a verb, an active word. We have the power to grace others as we ourselves would like to be graced. Um, we're moving to a conclusion here. And Wendy, without any prompting from her dad, without having seen my opening script, spoke of something I had mentioned at the very outset. I had said something about our full humanity. And she mentioned being our best selves. Our, our mission in student and campus life is to inspire transformation among our students. And um, in order to do that, we have to be our best selves as staff. In order to do so for our students, our staff needs to take care of themselves. And for, uh, for many years, that was, that was kind of a, a, an afterthought. And uh, we have a leader now who is very focused on allowing staff to take care of themselves. And he asks specifically, how are you? And what can we do to make this easier? And um, what kind of, of resources can we provide in order to be our best selves for the students? Well, here are some things to think about, and you'll have some time maybe to set aside to think about this, a few moments in whatever quiet you can or will carve out. How can you achieve some balance in your life? Balance between work and play, between profession and family, stress and release. 
Are there ways to adjust your pace? Find a time to catch your breath and renew your spirit. How about teaming up with a colleague to, to share something each day that made you smile, that brought you joy? Or to lean on someone instead of holding it all in? In our online feedback time, in our Let's Hope It Really Happens Skylake retreat, maybe we can share some ideas about how to help one another meet the challenges of this time. If you can catch your breath, revitalize your spirit, you'll be doing it for yourself, for your profession, or for the people you serve with compassion and grace. During the past 24 minutes, I've been sharing a program that was created for a local hospital's committee on spirituality in the workplace. Those folks whose compassionate care for taking care of our neighbors during this troubling time to be energy draining, even spiritually challenging. The voices you heard contributing uh, to the conversation uh, were my adult children, uh, James Kellum, the Iron Man, uh, and whose day job is a a biology professor, that's his vocation, teaching biology to college students in Pennsylvania. And then Wendy Kellen Francis, who seeks balance and self-care in her administrative work at Cornell University. The video of today's Encounter program, by the way, is available if you'd like to share it with others uh, on the Broome County Council of Churches website. If you go to the broomcouncil.org website, you'll find a tab that says Encounter and you'll find this program as well as many others there. Uh, to enjoy and to share with, with other folks. That's broomcouncil.org. Look for the Encounter tab. As usual, we're grateful to WBNG-TV for broadcasting Encounter each week, as it has for decades, as well as to the Town Square Media Stations for playing the audio portion of our program as a public service. So I'm Jeff Kellum, Parish Associate at the Union Presbyterian Church in Endicott, encouraging you now and then to just take a deep breath, pause, Celebrate life, breathe in the Spirit of God, and then be gentle with people and with yourself. <laughs>